Many years ago, a 19-year-old pre-med student was in church and in a great church where the breeze was blowing through the windows, the sanctuary lantern was swinging like a pendulum. He was sort of overwhelmed with an insight as he looked at that pendulum because he'd been thinking about the problem of time. And you see, at that time, most clocks were off about 15 minutes every day, either too fast or too slow, and they hadn't been able to solve that problem. As he watched the sanctuary lamp swinging, he came up with an insight, one of those aha moments, what we often call an epiphany. And he was able to work on clocks to the point where they would no longer be 15 minutes too early or too late, but a matter of only 10 to 15 seconds. That young scholar was, by the way, named Galileo Galilei. Aha. A great epiphany. Galileo, instead of becoming a medical doctor, eventually became, as Einstein called him, the founder or the father of modern science. Aha moments. Today we celebrate the epiphany, the revelation or manifestation of the savior of the world to foreigners, to Gentiles, to what we believe were probably Persian scholars called the Magi. And if you ever see the documentary called The Star or The Star of Bethlehem, you will see the incredible design of the Almighty, the great designer of the universe, even in the heavens that led them by a star in the year 2 BC, because again, there was a miscalculation in time. Jesus was born two years before Christ, <laughs> which is kind of odd, isn't it? But about the year 2 BC, there was a great convergence of two planets, and it was recorded at that time by ancient scholars, the brightest light that had ever been seen in the night. And in those days, of course, they didn't have the pollution that we have, whether smog or light pollution. And so people were very accustomed at night to watching the stars. Well, these, though they thought they were stars, were actually planets, most likely Jupiter and Venus coming together and producing such an extraordinary light that it was seen by these scholars. Now you might say, well, how on earth did they ever take to this? Remember that the Israelites had been taken into captivity in Babylon Babylon, after they destroyed the great temple of Jerusalem, 586 BC or thereabouts, they were taken into Babylon and then the Babylonians, by the way, today's Iraq, were conquered by the Persians, today's Iran. And there were prophets still among the Jews like Daniel, who were giving great prophecies of the future. And they would have had the texts of Isaiah, for example, from which we hear in the first reading, arise. Shine, a great light has shone. Arise. They would have read that in Isaiah chapter 60, these magi. They were the priests or the scholars of the Persian Empire. They would have also come across the text that's quoted in today's gospel from Micah. And you, Bethlehem, least, right, among the tribes. But out of Bethlehem would come the Messiah. And so having studied these texts, when this extraordinary light broke, they followed the star. And we might ask ourselves, are we willing to follow the light of Christ wherever it would lead us? Well, they end up in Jerusalem, the great capital, and they believe that this child would be king of kings and lord of lords, but he's not there. They come to King Herod, and as you know, Herod doesn't even know where this child would be. Herod, who wouldn't have been very concerned about scripture, you remember, he was a paranoid megalomaniac. He had his wife killed, he had his sons killed, he had any rival potential to him killed and executed. And so he now very cryptically says he wants to know where this is. He sends for the scripture scholars, and then he tells the Magi to come back to him, because of course, he would want to kill any other potential rival, like a Messiah king. 
But they go and they worship and they praise and kneel down. Now, here are the interesting thing. They present, you might say, well, wait a minute, how does a star stop? Don't forget retrograde motion, you know, in the circular retrograde motion. For a moment, it appears to have stopped, and then it led them south, and that's exactly what the scholars have shown scientifically happened with Jupiter and Venus. It led them south. Only about five miles away from Jerusalem is Bethlehem. And then they found him. And they give him three gifts, as the scripture tell us. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now gold would be a gift fitting for a king. And he's the king of kings. They understood that this Messiah was a Messiah king. Incense is used and was used only for worship. They would worship God in the temples of the ancient world. And they bring frankincense because they somehow understand that this child is not only king among men, but he's divine. In fact, the scripture says that they came to worship the child. Now, nobody worships a child. Oh, grandparents may really love those kids, <laughs> but I hope they don't worship them, right? And yet the scripture says they came to worship the child, to worship him. They understood He's not only man, but he's divine. And then the third gift, perhaps the most mysterious, was myrrh. Myrrh was used to anoint a body at death. Now, could you imagine going to a christening party and bringing some myrrh for the child, the newborn? If the parents understood what myrrh really represented, they'd throw you out. How dare you? But they understood the prophecy also in Isaiah of a suffering servant that this Messiah would suffer and offer his life for the people, for the sheep of his flock. And so all of these gifts must have mystified Joseph and Mary as they see them being presented by these great scholars. They had had the poor shepherds, right? The Israelite shepherds who came to worship and now these scholars from the East who realizing that King Herod was not a godly man, then avoid him. But tragically, Herod still has the children killed when Joseph and Mary flee with their child to Egypt. Are we willing to go to any length to follow the light of Christ? These scholars took an arduous journey from Persia in the east to the Middle East in Israel. Where will it lead us? You know, we all face things that in this life sometimes are unbearable. You know, you may say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I've got to finally do something about X, Y, or Z. Well, I'll tell you about a young lady who did that. Bessie Pender and her husband Ben married very young in life. They had a number of children, and she had wanted to be a teacher, but she wasn't able to finish her education at, in college. And so she took a job at a school, but doing janitorial work at night to try and help her husband with paying the bills and caring for their family. This went on for some years, but she really wanted to be a teacher. And so finally, she decided she was gonna register for college and as long as it takes. Well, it took her seven years to get her teaching degree, but she finally got it and she took a job in that public school system where she had been mopping floors and now in the day, she was teaching children. And in a sh few short years, she was named Teacher of the Year. Never settle for less than what God has inspired you to do. She knew she was meant to be a teacher. It took her a long time to get there, but she did it. That was her epiphany, her moment to say, I've got to do it. What's your epiphany? It was a great Peanuts cartoon years ago in which Charlie Brown and Lucy have another encounter. And in this one, Lucy says to Charlie Brown, life is a mystery. Charlie Brown, do you know the answer? And the philosopher Charlie said this, be kind, don't smoke, be prompt, 
smile a lot, eat sensibly, avoid cavities, mark your ballot carefully, avoid too much sun, send overseas packages early, love all creatures above and below, ensure your belongings, and try to keep the ball low. Great wisdom, right? And not everybody appreciates it. You know what Lucy said in response? She said, hold real still, Charlie Brown, because I'm going to hit you with a very sharp blow to the nose. <laughs> she didn't get the epiphany. She didn't get the revelation of truth and the manifestation of goodness. Do we? Arise, shine. Your light has come. Yes, there is great darkness in our world. But we follow the one who gives us the way out, the one who shines the light in the darkness. Think, what is it that we can give in return for such great goodness? Well, those three gifts can represent something you and I can give. First of all, our sorrows, our sufferings, our crosses, that would be the myrrh that we bring to Jesus in life. The incense would be our true worship, our adoration of the Almighty. Our very purpose for coming into church is to worship the living God. And the gold would be the gold fit for our King, which is love. The gold of the love of our hearts, not only for God, but for neighbor as Jesus taught us. To love God with all our mind, heart, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself, that would be the golden gift. We can return to Christ. And then when we stand before him, and we see him face to face, as did the Magi through the face of the baby Jesus, how will we experience the living God? Bart Millard and his group Mercy Me gave us a song that makes me think about that called I Can Only Imagine. He writes, surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in awe of you, be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Yes, I imagine when we finally meet Christ face to face, our Savior King, our God who humbled himself to become one of us, and our God who would give his life on a cross for us, we probably won't be able to speak at all. All of our questions will be answered because we will be kneeling before love incarnate, the Word made flesh, the Savior of the world. And so I conclude today with the words of a great and blessed writer, Robert Louis Stevenson, with his prayer for the Christmas season. O oh God, our loving Father, help us rightly to remember the birth of Jesus, that we may share in the song of the angels, the gladness of the shepherds, the worship of the wise men. May the Christmas morning make us happy to be your children and Christmas evening bring us to our beds with grateful thoughts, forgiving and forgiven. For Jesus' sake, amen.